From a collection of unmitigated pedantry, the blog of history professor Brett Devereaux. This isn't Sparta. Part 2. Spartan Equality. This is part two of our seven-part look at Sparta. Last week, we took a look at our sources for Sparta and then examined the Spartan child training system, the Agoge. We found that our sources look nothing like the grizzled veterans who narrate films like 300, being instead mostly wealthy and snobbish Greeks from outside of Sparta. We also found that the Spartan Agoge was more like a child soldier training program, something out of the Lord's Resistance Army in Uganda, than any kind of education system as we understand it. This week, we're going to expand our look at Spartan society and examine the claim of Spartan equality. We'll do this first by looking at the various classes of people in Sparta, citizens, non-citizens, and slaves. And then, by looking at the issue of wealth equality among the Spartan citizenry. A helpful note to any new readers, the series seems to be reaching a lot of first-time folks. Welcome. Collections are part of my regular update schedule every Friday. So part three of this series will appear next Friday, and so on. I sometimes have midweek updates, time permitting, but obviously my day job comes first, especially now that classes have started. As always, a helpful glossary of terms is here if you need it, but I'll be defining things as we go, so you should be a-okay. As always, if you like what you are reading here, please share it. If you really like it, you can support me on Patreon. And if you want updates whenever a new post appears, you can click below for email updates or follow me on Twitter at Brett Devereaux for updates as to new posts as well as my occasional ancient history, foreign policy, or military history musings. The Myth of Spartan Equality Now 300, and indeed many pop cultural representations of Sparta, do not always tell us in words that Spartan society was equal. Rather, what they tend to do is show us that it is. Visual language in film is, if anything, more powerful than dialogue, but it can be harder to really pin down. But let's put in the effort, if just so that I'm not accused of attacking a straw man. When 300 shows us the Spartans living in town, they look like this. Image, Spartan men and women gathered around the king and queen. Image description. It's hard to capture this in a still screenshot, but as the camera pans in a circle around the main characters, there are at least 10 Spartans dressed exactly like the two in the back, all milling around. End of image description. And in On the March, they look like this. Image. Spartan 300 gathered together. Image description. It's strange, the ancient sources portray the Spartiates, if anything, as a bit vain, combing out their hair before battle, decorating their shields, and so on. This image of neatly identical Spartans is decidedly ahistorical. End of image description. Identical, interchangeable Spartans. What's interesting here is that Frank Miller and Zack Snyder have taken such pains to emphasize the identical nature of each of these men to the point of breaking with things we know about them. Each Spartan in the film has an identical shield with an identical lambda on it. But we actually know Plutarch, Moralia, section 234, line 41, that individual Spartans painted their shields with a variety of individual devices. Likewise, the Spartans brought their own armor, quote, for their own sake, end quote. See, for example, Plutarch, Moralia, section 220, line 2. And it is safe to assume, given the variety of armor and helmets in Greece of the period, that the Spartan battle line would have itself had a fairly wide variety of styles. Image, Samurai Jack and the Spartans. Image description. The Spartans of Samurai Jack's telling. One long line of identical Spartans save for the king and his foreign time-traveling guest. End of image description. Fortunately, this implicit visual signaling of Spartan equality is often converted into explicit written explications. 
To take just one example, this article by Nick Burns in The New Republic praises Spartan, quote, relative economic equality, end quote, and, quote, cultural egalitarianism, end quote, and goes on to say, quote, Lycurgus, the founder of the Spartan regime, is said to have decreed that only iron bars would be accepted as currency. It became so difficult to make or accumulate money, since it had to be carted around in huge wheelbarrows, that citizens gave up on their desire to make a fortune and reconciled themselves to living on a largely materially equal basis to their fellow citizens. Lycurgus also had all the citizens eat together at common tables in an effort to prevent the development of luxurious habits and to make sure private relationships, even familial ones, did not undermine the community. End quote. We'll come around to the person of Lycurgus the next time. Spoilers, semi-divine mythical founder figures should not be treated like historical figures. In a, I should stress, civil and polite Twitter conversation with me afterwards, Nick Burns clarified his view. Image. Tweets from Nick Burns saying, To my eye, the most impressive thing about Sparta was the degree of equality and cohesion among citizens. Was that only possible through tyrannizing the surrounding population? That's not unlikely. But the thought occurs that they could have been tyrannized just as much and still have been unequal among their ranks. I think of Schumpeter's dictum. Democracy is the rule by a subset of society which is democratic within its own ranks. End of tweets. This idea, the degree of equality and cohesion, is what I prefer to call the myth of Spartan equality. And it's going to be our target today. Where does this idea come from? Well, it comes from the same pro-Spartan sources we discussed last time. Plutarch claims that Lycurgus' decision to banish money from Sparta essentially removed greed by making all of the Spartans equal. Plutarch, Life of Lycurgus, section 9, lines 1 to 4. Or equally poor, though we should note that Plutarch is writing 900 years after Lycurgus again, probably not a real person, was supposed to have lived. Xenophon notes, approvingly, that Lycurgus forbid the Spartans from engaging in productive business of any kind, making them thus unable to accumulate wealth. Xenophon, Polity of the Lacedaemonians, section 7, lines 1 to 6. Land was supposed to be distributed equally to each full Spartan citizen. The Spartiates or homoioi would define these terms in a second in equal plots called cleroi. This idea, the myth of Spartan equality, is perhaps the single biggest idea in the conception of the Spartan state, rivaled only by the myth of Spartan military excellence. Don't worry, we'll get there. There is something deeply appealing at a bedrock emotional level to the idea of a perfectly equal society like that. And that myth of equality has prompted all sorts of thinkers from all sorts of eras, Rousseau most famously, including our own, to be willing to look past Sparta's many, many failings. And on the face of it, it does sound like a very equal society, practically a collectivist utopia. It is a pleasant vision. Unfortunately, it is also a lie. Meet the Spartans, a helot of a lot of helots. Let's begin by sketching the shape of Spartan society. The Greek term for the basic political unit of Greek life is a polis, plural polis. Originally, this word meant town or city, but over time it came to mean something close to community or state. It was possible to have a polis without a city, as Sparta did, or a city without a polis. For instance, towns and cities which did not self-govern. Instead, a polis was identified in our ancient sources with a body of citizens. For example, the Spartans, the Thebans, the Athenians, etc. And also included the government those citizens set up, and the territory that government controls. While every polis had a body of citizens at its core, Polis also included various non-citizen underclasses. 
foreigners and slaves typically. Citizenship in Greek cities was hereditary and strictly regulated. So foreigners here might mean families which had lived in the polis for generations, but which weren't part of the original citizen body. Nevertheless, only the citizenry, however it was defined, had full legal and political rights. These free non-citizens often had to pay the full burden of being citizens, taxes, military service, etc., without any of the benefits, voting, serving on juries, access to public services, etc. So every Greek polis had a three-level layer cake of status, the citizen body, free non-citizens, like foreigners, and non-free persons, slaves. You could, and the Greeks did, divide that top group by wealth and birth and so on, but we'll get to that a bit later in this post and the next. For now, let's stick with the three-level layer cake. Sparta follows this scheme neatly. At the top, were the Spartiates, the full citizen male Spartans. According to Herodotus, there were once 8,000 of them. Herodotus, Book 7, Section 234, Line 2. Supposedly 9,000 based on the initial number of equal land plots. Clairoy, hand it out. Plutarch, Life of Lycurgus, Section 8, Line 3. Or, rather than saying handed out, we might say seized. Of course, these are tallies of Spartiate males, but women could be of citizen stock, but not citizens themselves, and we ought to imagine an equal number of Spartiate women at any given time. For a child to be born into the citizen class, and thus eligible for the agoge and future full citizenship, he had to have a citizen father and a citizen mother. We'll deal with the bastards a bit further down. Also, the Spartiates were often also called the homoioi, sometimes translated as peers, but literally meaning something like the equals. As we'll see, that equality is notional at best, but this ideal of citizen equality was something Sparta advertised about itself. Image. Spartan market scene. Image description. I wonder about this market scene. Are these women meant to be helots or perioike? If so, they are the only representatives of either that we see in the entire film. But I suspect at least some of them are intended as Spartiate women. As we'll see below, Spartiate women would have little reason to haul raw wool. They do not appear to have woven or spun their own cloth. Instead, Xenophon implies that helot women were forced to produce clothing for them. End of image description. The number of Spartiates declined rapidly during the period for which we have evidence, from roughly 480 onwards. While there were supposedly 8,000 male Spartiates in 480, there seemed to have only been 3,500 by 418, Thucydides, section 5, line 68. Just 2,500 in 394, Xenophon, Hellenica, Book 4, Section 2, Line 16, and just 1,500 in 371. Xenophon, Hellenica, Book 6, Section 1, Line 1, Book 4, Section 15, Line 17. We'll talk about why this collapse occurred and its impacts more next week, but for now, I want to note it because it raises some skepticism that there were ever as many Spartiates as Herodotus or Plutarch would have us believe. Nevertheless, we're going to accept the figure of 8,000 for now. Over time, Sparta developed a bewildering array of sub-citizen underclasses which were free but enjoyed limited rights and had no say in their government. The largest and most important of these were the Perioikoi, literally, the dwellers around. When the Spartan polis formed, the poor farmers around the core villages seemed to have reduced to hillitage. We're getting there, I promise. But the outlying settlements, while subjugated by the Spartan state, remained free. The Periokoi did not attend the agoge, had no say in government, and no role in Spartan equality, meaning they were excluded from all the benefits the Spartan state provided. But, they were allowed to manage their own affairs, save that they had to fight in the Spartan army. 
Almost all of the good, productive land seems to have been reserved for the Clairoi of the Spartiates. So the Perioikoi were mostly economically marginal, shoved onto the bad farmland, but they did make up the artisan class, who will have made the armor, weapons, and tools required by the Spartiates. The Skirite were a special group of Perioikoi, who dwelt up in the mountains. They served differently in the army, but otherwise do not seem to have been legally different from the Perioikoi. For this post, we'll treat them together. Alongside the Perioikoi, we have also the Hypomeones and Mothakis. The Hypomeones seem to consist of the men and their descendants who had been Spartiates, but had been stripped of citizen status for some reason, usually poverty but sometimes cowardice. Since it was normally impossible to reobtain citizenship, even for children, they constituted a permanent underclass with rights much like the Periokoi. The Mothakes, singular Mothox, seem to have been the bastard offspring of Spartiate men and Helot women. We'll come back to this. Xenophon, Hellenica, Book 5, Section 3, Line 9, refers to these men as Nothoi, literally bastards. Some Mothakes were sponsored into the Agoge by wealthy Spartiates, but they could never be citizens, and thus never be entitled to the things full Spartiates had. So they, too, represent an effectively permanent underclass in Sparta. Finally, over time there accrued small groups of freed Helots, the Neodemodes and the Brasidoi, the latter seeming to just be a specific group of the former. These were settled on the edge of Spartan territory, on land disputed with Elise. So, apart from being given the worst garbage real estate in all of Sparta, they seem to have had functionally the same position as the rest of the non-citizen underclasses. Estimating the size of the various free, non-citizen Spartan underclasses is essentially guesswork. Our sources are profoundly uninterested in these people because, as we discussed last week, our sources are mostly elite snobs who are interested in writing about other elite snobs and thus care little for the lower classes. Estimates are made harder in that it seems fairly clear, given the evidence, that the Hypomiones, Mothakes, and Neodemodes all increased in number over time. Still, Periokoi battle deployments tend to equal or exceed Spartan numbers, even in 480, so it seems safe to assume there are somewhat more Periokoi than Spartiates. I've tentatively offered 30,000 as a guesstimate of their total number circa 500 BC, rising significantly over time. I think you could make a convincing argument that this number was significantly higher, especially if you are arguing for a smaller number of helots. See below. We'll talk about all of these fellows more next week. Finally, the helots were slaves owned by the Spartan state who worked the Clairoi owned by the Spartiates. So you have the land, but the state owns the labor, and owed some portion of their produce, seemingly quite a lot of it, to the Spartiates. The Helots came in two big groups. The Laconian Helots had lived in Sparta before the polis formed and had been reduced to Helotage at that time. The Mycenaean Helots were the free residents of the neighboring community of Mycenae when it was conquered by Sparta in the early 600s, at which point almost the entire population was reduced to being Helots. There were roughly 200,000 Helots, vastly outnumbering every other group in Sparta or all of them combined. Okay, I know that's an awful lot of information. Sparta has a bewildering array of underclasses, but it's important because of how it impacts the makeup of the Spartan state. Pictured below is a rough estimate of the population of Sparta in roughly 480 by class. Image. Chart showing the distribution of Spartan social classes. Image description. Notes. The number of male Spartiates and corresponding citizen women is higher than Herodotus's 8,000 to account for children who ought to make up roughly one-third of the population. Technically, 
They were not Spartiates until they completed the Agoge, but I have included them here since they are of citizen status. Estimating the number of Periokoi and other free non-citizens is essentially guesswork. Here I have reasoned from the Periokoi serving with the Spartan army, who in the early 400s seem to be roughly equal in number, generally, to the number of Spartiates present at any given time. There have been efforts by more recent scholars to downgrade the size of the Helot population. Thomas Figuera has presented a valuable synthesis of such efforts, it's a good read if you are into such things, which reduces the Helot population to 110 to 120,000 or so. I think the modeling done is valuable, but essentially creates a lower bound, what is the smallest number of Helots who could support this system, which assumes, in my mind, an unreasonably efficient extraction system. So, I have gone with some of the slightly older estimates, which I think probably come closer to reality. But I wanted to note briefly that somewhat, but not radically, lower estimates exist. In all estimates, the Spartiates are outnumbered by Helots several times over. In terms of the argument here, it hardly matters if the Spartiates are outnumbered 5 to 1, 7 to 1, 8 to 1, the ratio above, or as has been suggested for later periods, 16 to 1 or more. What matters is that the overwhelming majority of human beings living in Spartan territory were Helots. End of image description. Whoa, I hear you say. That's a lot of slaves, like a ton of enslaved people. But then, ancient slavery was common, right? Was this normal for a Greek polis? Well, let's compare this chart, done exactly the same way, of Athens in roughly the same period. Image. Distribution of social classes in Athens. Image description. Note. Really, we should speak in ranges, but it's hard to convey that graphically. Estimates for the number of citizens range from 60,000 to 140,000. But Thucydides' figure, Thucydides Book 2, Section 13, Lines 6 to 8, argues strongly for a number around 100,000, consistent with the roughly 30,000 hoplites Athens was to have had. The number of medics is largely guesswork, but most estimates assume they are significantly outnumbered by the citizenry in the 5th century. It is also often assumed that the medic population was male-shifted, given who was likely to go abroad to do business in ancient Greece. But note also, many medics were multi-generational residents of Athens. The number of slaves is an unknown. The two ancient figures cited seem to be impossible on a population density basis. Probably the number of slaves equaled or even slightly exceeded the size of the citizen body. The overall size of the population in Attica, the territory of Athens, should be somewhere between 200,000 and 300,000. I've gone with M. H. Hansen's 1986 figures here. Unfortunately, a lot of the newer work on Greek demography, like M. H. Hansen's The Shotgun Method, 2006, or J. N. Corvisay, La Population de l'Antique Classique, 2000, are more focused on estimating total population rather than population breakdown by social class. I should also stress that estimates for the population of individual Greek polis are deep guesswork. In many cases, Belloc, 1886, no, that is not a typo, 1886, remains a standard reference. End of image description. Athens was a very wealthy city which both drew in many foreign merchants and businessmen, but also was able to import huge numbers of slaves, all things Sparta most emphatically did not do. And yet, the citizen body is still a much larger proportion of the total population. To give an ancient but non-Greek comparison, these pie charts compare Athens, 5th century BC, Sparta, roughly 480, Sparta, after the decline of the Spartiates had taken hold, 371 BC, and Roman Italy, circa 218, on the eve of the Second Punic War. Image. Pie charts demonstrating social classes in ancient states. Image description. 
Note, obviously all of this is somewhat approximate, but the general pattern holds. I would say that these charts do a bit of a disservice to the Italian allies, or Sochi, who generally had greater rights and privileges than Athenian medics or Spartan periokoi. Unlike either of those groups, the Sochi were full citizens of their own communities, which they still lived in, and thus had a say in their own self-government, if not foreign policy. Roman law offered considerably more protections to most Sochi, even in Rome, than did Athenian or Spartan law. Figures for Roman Italy follow Brunt, 1971, because I had it at hand. I actually prefer Launaro's estimate, Peasants and Slaves, 2011, for exciting technical reasons that aren't worth getting into here, the graph would not look very different at all in terms of relative percentages. I should note one key difference. The Roman pie, if drawn to scale, would be 20 times larger than the Athenian or Spartan ones. I should also note that estimates of the population of Roman Italy are far more reliable than those for Greece. The evidence is much better. Note that if we had a second Roman chart, dated to, say, the death of Augustus, 14 AD, the gray slice would be twice as big, but almost the entire orange slice would be blue. End of image description. So the point here is, if we want to talk about life in Sparta, roughly 85% of that conversation should be about the life of the helots. So, let's talk about them. It's a helot life for us. I want to open by stressing just how insane that previous statement is, that helots made up not only a simple majority of the human beings living under the Spartan state, but in fact a huge super majority. For comparison, about a third of the population of the American South in 1860 was held in slavery, and we rightly call that a slave society. Societies where an absolute majority of persons are held in slavery are extremely rare, but Sparta's massive supermajority of enslaved persons is, to my knowledge, unique in human history. We are very poorly informed about the helots. Our snobbish sources, recall last week, are, for the most part, singularly uninterested in them. So we're left putting together a patchwork of information. That in turn leads into situations where students of ancient Greece can come up with the wrong impression if they don't have all of the sources in mind. We'll see this as a common trend with Sparta. Reading just Xenophon, or just Plutarch, can be deeply misleading. First, let us dispense with the argument sometimes offered that the helots were more like medieval serfs than slaves as we understand the ideas, and thus not really slaves. This is nonsense. Helots seem to have been able to own movable property, money, clothing, etc., but in fact this is true of many ancient slaves, including Roman ones, the Romans called this quasi-property peculium, which also applied to the property of children and even many women who were under the legal power, potestas, of another. Owning small amounts of movable property was not rare among ancient non-free individuals, or for that matter, other forms of slavery. No, what legally separated helots from douloi, chattel slaves in most Greek societies, was that they were slaves of the Spartan state rather than of individual Spartans. This had nothing to do with any sense of greater freedom they might have had. Indeed, Plutarch relates the saying that, quote, in Sparta the free man is more free than anywhere else in the world, and the slave more a slave, end quote. Plutarch, Life of Lycurgus, section 28, line 5. He can only be referring to the helots here. Indeed, Plutarch's statement is telling. The helots were treated poorly by the standards of ancient chattel slavery, which is, I must stress, an incredibly low bar. 
Ancient societies treated enslaved people absolutely horribly, and yet somehow the Helot lot was commonly thought worse. But the final word on if we should consider the Helots fully non-free is in their sanctity of person. They had none at all whatsoever. Every year, in autumn, by ritual, the five Spartan magistrates known as the Ephors, next week, declared war between Sparta and the Helots. Sparta essentially declares war on part of itself so that any Spartiate might kill any Helot without legal or religious repercussions. Plutarch, Life of Lycurgus, section 28, line 4. Note also Herodotus, book 4, section 146, line 2. Isocrates, admittedly a decidedly anti-Spartan voice, notes that it was a religious, if not legal, infraction to kill slaves everywhere in Greece except Sparta. Isocrates, section 12, line 181. As a matter of Athenian law, killing a slave was still murder. The same is true in Roman law. One assumes these rules were often ignored by slaveholders, of course. We know that many such laws in the American South were routinely flouted. Slavery is, after all, a brutal and inhuman institution by its very nature. The absence of any taboo, legal or religious, against the killing of helots marks the institution as uncommonly brutal, not merely by Greek standards, but by world historical standards. We may safely conclude that the helots were not only enslaved persons, but that of all slaves, they had some of the fewest protections, effectively none, not even protections in name only. Image. Riders passing through Spartan grain fields. Image description. Wow, those are some lovely fields of grain. So much grain. I wonder who farms it. End of image description. But what do the helots do? The answer is mostly they farm, but getting more specific than that gets sticky fast. We may try to keep this brief. Helots were enslaved agricultural laborers. Helots were owned not by individual Spartiates, but by the Spartan state, where they were assigned, through whatever method we do not know, to work the plots of land, Clairoy, see above, assigned to the Spartiates who, as noted above, were forbidden from engaging in any kind of productive labor. The Helots seem to have lived in their own villages and settlements, no great surprise, as the Mycenaean Helots seem to have been far more numerous than the Laconian ones, and the Spartiates themselves did not live in Mycenae in any great numbers. It does seem that the Mycenaean Helots were gathered in a smaller number of nucleated villages rather than split up as farmsteads, probably to make it easier for the small number of Spartiates stationed there to keep watch on them. And they seem to have produced not only simple cereal staples, but the full range of agricultural products. Wheat, Xenophon, Polity of the Lacedaemonians, section 5, line 3. We'll come back to this. Barley, grapes and wine, figs, olives and olive oil, cheese, textiles, wool, and animal products, including meat and fish. Super pedantic note. This range of production is one reason why I'd argue that the efforts of scholars like Figuera and Hodkinson tend to set a lower bound to the number of helots, picking up my note to the chart above. They're working from a simplified model of agriculture producing entirely in barley and wheat. I should stress, this is not bad practice. You pretty much have to do this to get anything out of the limited evidence we have. But the huge range of agricultural production the helots are engaged with pretty much demands many helots engaged in tasks that are not wheat and barley cultivation, and yet more helots engage in supporting them. Such models also assume that helot labor was effectively allocated, which would be very strange for ancient agriculture. Peasant households are almost always labor inefficient. Too many hands, too little land or capital. On this, see Erdkamp, The Grain Market in the Roman Empire, 2005. 
We don't know what percentage of the agricultural goods produced by Helots was required to be turned out to the Spartiate family which owned their Clairos. Plutarch gives a, evidently maximum, figure of 82 medimnoi of barley to be paid annually to a single Spartiate household by the Helots of their Clairos. Plutarch, Life of Lycurgus, section 8, line 4. But note Cartledge, 1979-170, on the troubles with this passage. This is, it must be noted, a huge amount. Roughly ten times the rations of a Roman soldier. Tyrtaeus, writing in the 7th century BC, our earliest source for Sparta, in a fragment says that the Helots, quote, like donkeys suffering under heavy loads, by painful force compelled to bring their masters half of all the produce that the soil brought forth, end quote. Translation, West, Greek Lyric Poetry, 1993. Half is a tempting figure, but it's also a nice, awkwardly round, and poetically convenient figure, which may not represent reality. But we do not have the necessary evidence to determine the average size of a clerus or the number of helots who might work it, so it is hard to figure out how burdensome this would have been save that we may assume very much so, given the sheer quantity demanded. 50% is a very high rent indeed. But I think it is worth stressing just how extreme the division of labor was. Helots did all of the labor, because the Spartiates were quite possibly the least productive people to ever exist. The Periokoi presumably also produced a lot of goods for the Spartiates, but being free, one imagines they had to be compensated for that out of the only economic resource the Spartiates possessed, the produce of Helot labor. The Spartiates were forbidden from taking up any kind of productive activity at all. Plutarch, Life of Lycurgus, section 24, line 2. Lysander is shocked that the Persian prince, Cyrus, gardens as a hobby. Xenophon, Oeconomicus, section 4, lines 20 to 25. Because why sully your hands with labor if you don't have to? Given the normal divisions of household labor, textile production in the Greek household was typically done by women, it is equally striking that not one of Plutarch's sayings of Spartan women in the Moralia concerns weaving, save for one, where a Spartan woman shames an Ionian one for being proud of her skill in it. Plutarch, Moralia 241d. Xenophon confirms that Spartiate women did not weave, but relied on helot labor for that too. Xenophon, Polity of the Lacedaemonians, section 1, line 4, a point we'll return to next week. The helots were also made to fight. We are told by Herodotus that the Spartans brought 35,000 helots to fight at Plataea. 479 BC, Herodotus, Book 9, Section 28, Line 2. And helot forces of light infantry appear elsewhere in the sources. But slaves of all kinds attached to ancient armies are often omitted in the sources. One wonders how many helots were forced to remain with Leonidas in his doomed last stand at Thermopylae. It is a safe bet it was more than the 300 Spartiates present, along with roughly 1,000 periokoi, Diodorus, section 11, line 4. One cannot imagine the helots were enthused to give their lives for a state which hated and brutalized them. But rarely loyal helots were rewarded with freedom. For example, the Brasidoi. The helots seem to have comprised essentially the entire Spartan logistical system, carrying food and supplies, although as we'll see, Spartan logistics are hardly impressive. Image, the 300 Spartan army on the march. Image description. Missing from this image of a Spartan army on the march, several hundred helots being forced to haul all of the baggage and equipment. Also missing, 900 plus periokoi who the Spartiates forced to come on their suicide mission with them. End of image description. Given the huge disparity in numbers between the Helots and the Spartiates, you may reasonably ask, how did the Spartiates maintain control? 
the answer appears to be, in a word, terror. As noted above, the Spartiates had a legal and religious fiction which enabled them to murder Helots at any time for any reason or no reason without legal or religious consequences. And now is when we return to the Cryptea, which we last met as a rite of passage for young Spartiate men graduating from the Agoge. Now we meet the same institution as a tool of terror. Some Sparta-friendly scholars have tried to minimize the role of the Cryptea, but it is hard to avoid the impression of the sources that this was a pervasive and deeply violent institution. Plutarch describes its function. The members of the Cryptea would fan out in secret over the countryside, murdering helots they caught by night or else sneaking into the fields and murdering helots thought too strong, brave, or independent-minded. Even Plutarch describes the institution as abominable, and thus tries to distance it from Lycurgus. But as already noted, his date, post-460 BC, does not work, since Herodotus considers the institution to already have some considerable antiquity to the events of 480. Herodotus, Book 4, Section 146, Line 2. Thucydides relates an incident, Thucydides, Section 4, Line 80, where the Spartans, in a ruse, offered 2,000 helots who had fought bravely for them in war their freedom before shortly after murdering all of them. Herodotus' report, Herodotus, Book 4, Section 146, Line 2, that the Spartans do all of their executions at night also speaks to the terror of the Cryptea. One assumes these executions are without trial, which in turn means they can only be the executions of the Helots. Even when they were not being murdered, the Helots were treated with cruelty. Plato, Laws, section 6, lines 776c to line 778a, politely presents the institution as contentious, and while noting that ill treatment as a factor that leads to slave revolts, along with commonality of language, also notes that such revolts are frequent among the Mycenaean helots, with the clear implication that the Mycenaean helots revolt very often because they are very badly treated. Plutarch relates humiliating rituals where helots would be compelled to get badly drunk and humiliated in front of the communal mess, the cessatia, as an object lesson, or else made to sing humiliating songs. Plutarch, Life of Lycurgus, section 28, lines 4 to 5. Various fragments from the Greek historians relate other demeaning humiliations enforced on the helots with varying degrees of reliability. Kennel, Spartans, 2010, pages 83 to 87, has a good roundup. Given how very little our sources care for the lives and experiences of any enslaved people, the unanimity of their testimony that life as a helot was awful is nothing short of astounding. This is an institution that shocks the conscience of ancient slaveholders. Image. Spartan village and field. Image description. No, really, that's a lot of grain. Surely there will be some farmers in this movie. No, no farmers at all. End of image description. A child's fingerprints. Taking my ancient historian hat off for a moment and putting on my military historian hat. Helmet? It seems very likely working from more modern parallels, that this brutality was itself a product of the agoge, organizational culture studies of modern militaries, which had the advantage of a wealth of evidence we simply do not have for the ancient world, have turned up strong connections between violence and brutality within the military apparatus, for instance in training, and the violent and brutal behavior of those militaries when they are among citizens. Put in more blunt language, armies that abuse and beat recruits or junior soldiers in training and in peacetime will tend to abuse and murder citizens in occupied territory and in wartime. Violence also rolls downhill, it turns out. 
Soldiers who are abused by their superiors tend in turn to abuse their subordinates, both as a learned behavior, but also as a transference mechanic. They repair the humiliation of receiving violence by inflicting it on someone even more powerless than them. This relationship is best documented in the Imperial Japanese military. For example, S. Ainaga, The Pacific War, 1978, pages 46 to 54, but also observed in the German Imperial Army. I. Hull, Absolute Destruction, 2006, pages 93 to 103. Though I should note that Hull focuses largely on the failure of command and political structures to apply the brakes to this tendency. See also for the Wehrmacht in World War II, O. Bartov, The Conduct of War, Soldiers, and the Barbarization of Warfare, 1992. And hey, what do you know? Two other armies that somehow gained a reputation for badass military effectiveness despite a comprehensive inability to achieve strategic objectives, resulting in the complete annihilation of the state they were supposed to defend. It's almost like we have a pattern. Consider what the young Spartiate, soon to be given the unrestricted power of life and death over his helot subjects, is learning in the agoge. When he is inducted, his mistakes are corrected by the physical violence of the older boys. Xenophon, Polity of the Lacedaemonians, section 2, line 2. In a system where the reward for success is moving up the ladder of violence. That is, the young Spartiate graduates from being just a victim of violence to being rewarded by also being allowed, indeed encouraged, to inflict violence on boys still younger and weaker than himself. Image. Young Leonidas fighting another boy. Image description. Societies inculcate their values in childhood. Militaries inculcate their values in training. What values are being inculcated here? End of image description. We are not told that this pattern continues past the agoge, although Xenophon, Polity of the Lacedaemonians, section 4, lines 5 to 6, strongly implies it noting that physical violence in resolving disputes was common. But, again speaking with my military history helmet on, of course it did. Why wouldn't it? Unlike Rome or Athens, which drew bright legal distinctions between places where military discipline, and thus disciplinary violence, was permitted and where it was not, Roman citizens were legally immune from corporal punishment except when on campaign. Beating a fellow Athenian citizen with the intent to humiliate him was hubris, a legally defined crime, punishable by death. Sparta was, our sources remind us, always mobilized for war, and the Spartiates were always under military discipline. Plutarch, Life of Lycurgus, section 24, line 1, Xenophon, Polity of the Lacedaemonians, section 3, lines 2 to 5. On military discipline, see for example Xenophon, Anabasis, book 3, section 4, line 49, where Xenophon lets his troops give a fellow soldier a beating for complaining, which may give us some insight into why Xenophon sees Sparta as an ideal society. With all of this violence rolling downhill, there is only one place for it to stop and that is the helots. The violence is a consequence of the damage inflicted on each generation of Spartiates by the previous generation. Broken men perpetuating a broken system, on the backs and with the blood of the helots, for the reasons we outlined last week. At the same time, it is the only tool the Spartiates have for maintaining the helots in slavery, since their social system is singularly terrible at equipping them to build any other kind of legitimacy, a point we'll return to in more depth at the end of this series. To put this in Arndt's terms, the Spartiates' only tool is violence, because their training completely eschews power. See H. Arndt on Violence, 1969. Arndt would, I think, identify this system 
as badly broken. Violence filling the vacuum left by a lack of power. And that seems correct. All right, taking my military historian helmet off, putting my ancient historian cap back on, and onward to drawing boxes. What can we conclude from this? I don't mean to beat up more on poor Nick Burns, who I must stress was perfectly civil in our Twitter discussion, and said nothing I have not seen in student papers and discussions in the past. But he exemplifies a certain kind of broken thinking about Sparta. Image. Tweets from Nick Burns saying, Hey, thanks for the comments. I see I'm not likely to sway such an erudite lover of Rome as yourself, but here's a few thoughts. First, evaluating Spartan society, like any other society, always involves first drawing boxes. Do you count the helots in Periokoi or not? By the same token, do we count Athenian slaves, women, the Delian League? Do we count the Roman territories without citizenship, etc., etc.? I'm guessing that 20 over 23 number comes from counting the Periokoi and Helots as unfree. The latter were certainly the former less so. End of tweets. Burns essentially asks, can't we just draw a box around the Spartiates and assess them on their own? And what I hope the preceding analysis has shown is that the answer is no, you can't. The helots and the brutality the Spartan state inflicts on them are integral to the system. They can't be removed. Without helot labor, there is effectively no Spartan economy and no agricultural production to support the Spartiate class's leisure. The brutality is the vital tool of maintaining those laborers in a state of slavery. Without it, the system cannot function in its abominable way. Without the helots, Sparta's military power collapses, not only because of the loss to the Spartiates, but also because the helots seem to make up large forces of light infantry screens. Image, Spartan 300 marching. Image description. But no, seriously, this movie has literally erased around 95% of all the humans in this society in order to focus completely on the Spartiates. I whine about Game of Thrones caring so little for the small folk, but even Benioff and Wise didn't just delete them all. Also, these 300 Spartans are apparently going to march hundreds of miles to Thermopylae with no food, Water, clothing, tents, or supplies of any kind. Good luck with that. End of image description. And in sheer numerical terms, the helots were Sparta. If we want to talk about drawing boxes, the box we ought to draw is not around the Spartiates, but around the helots. The helots so decisively outnumber the Spartiates that any assessment of this society has to be about the quality of helot life, which is terrible. To draw boxes as Burns wants would be like putting a box around Jeff Bezos and declaring that America was the first all-billionaire society. In actual fact, American millionaires represent roughly the same percentage of America as the Spartiates represent of Sparta. Roughly 6%. This is a fundamental flaw in how we teach Sparta, in high schools and in college. We teach Sparta like it was a free citizen society with a regrettable slave population that, while horrific, was typical for its time. Something more like Rome. But it wasn't. Sparta was a society that consisted almost entirely of slaves, with a tiny elite aristocracy. The Spartiates were not the common citizens of Sparta, but rather the hereditary nobility, the knights, counts, and dukes, as it were. We should as soon 
judged 17th century France by the first two estates as judged Sparta only by the Spartiates. But by now you are wondering, this sounds like a conclusion, but there's still a bunch of post left. That scroll bar is moving awfully slow. What does this pedantic fellow have up his sleeve? Well, here it is. Even if we accept Burns's boxes, even if we draw a wall around the Spartiates, to be clear, we should not do this, but even if we do, Sparta still fails to live up to its myth of equality. The myth of the homoioi. Now I want to be clear, the guys who call themselves homoioi were not a myth. Absolutely the Spartiates existed. But I want to tackle that word, homoioi. It means peers, but literally translates as equals, or those who are the same. The ideal was straightforward. Each homoios, meaning each Spartiate householder, had an equal plot of land an equal share of enslaved, brutalized, terrorized, helot labor, an equal place in the Spartan mess, the Sasitia, an equal voice in the Apella, the Spartan voting assembly. They were equals. The crux of this is economic equality. No poor Spartiates, no rich Spartiates. Herodotus implies this. Xenophon tells us this. Aristotle and Plato report this ideal. Plutarch comments on it repeatedly. And it is complete nonsense. Let's start with Plutarch. Plutarch, writing roughly 100 AD, says that this ideal existed in the past under Lycurgus, who we'll get to later. But that was in the past, and that at some point, he puts it in the reign of Agus II and Lysander, wealth flowed in and corrupted the system. Plutarch, Life of Lycurgus, section 30, lines 1 to 2. Sure, he says, Sparta isn't an equal paradise now, but it used to be, back in the time of Xenophon, more or less. So, we go back to Xenophon. Xenophon, writing in the early 300s BC, says that this equal ideal absolutely existed, wait for it, but that was in the past, and at some point, he's living in the reign of Agus II, so it must be earlier, the Spartans got rich and traveled abroad and it corrupted the system. Xenophon, Polity of the Lacedaemonians, section 14, lines 1 to 5. Sure, he says, Sparta isn't an equal paradise now, but it used to be. Back in the time of Herodotus, when the Spartans led the Greeks against the Persians. So, we back up to Herodotus, writing roughly 430 BC, but about events as early as the late 500s. Except Herodotus notes explicitly two wealthy Spartans, Spurthius and Bullus, both clearly Spartiates. They are going as representatives of the Spartan citizen body as ambassadors, who are, quote, of noble birth and great wealth, end quote, going on an embassy before 480 BC. Herodotus, section 7, line 134. So not only are they rich, they're gegonotes ou, literally born well, meaning they come from families which have been rich for a long time. The Spartans also evidently have debt keeping, Herodotus, section 6, line 59, and toy with colonialization, generally a response to land scarcity, Herodotus, section 5, lines 42 to 46. So, apparently Sparta wasn't an equal paradise even then, or even well before that point. So let's back up even further to the earliest literary evidence we have for Sparta, the lyric poets Alcman and Tyrtaeus, writing in the 7th century. Tyrtaeus, roughly 650, Alcman, perhaps a few decades later. We've already noted Tyrtaeus speak of the suffering of the Helots, but he also makes oblique references to social divisions and poverty. Tyrtaeus, fragment 6, 7, 10, West, 1993, pages 23 to 24. Alkman, describing what seems to be a dancer's chorus, describes gold bangles, splendid headbands, and other finery. 
Alkman, Fragment 1, West, 1993, page 32. I should stress that the limited productivity of ancient societies means that no society can produce such finery to all of its women. These women are showing off their uncommon wealth. I want to stress these poets' work exists only in disjointed fragments, and yet even in this very poor source base, we have solid evidence for rich and poor Spartiates. To be clear with how far back we are here historically, the critical event which creates the Spartan state we know, the conquest of Messenia and the reduction of the Messenians to helotry, happened, according to Tyrtaeus, in his grandfather's generation. We've gotten to the living memory of the origins of the Spartan state as we understand it, and we still have not gotten back to that ideal past of equality. So let's back up even further. Back into the early 7th century or even the 8th century. We are now before all of our literary sources, but lo, archaeology and epigraphy, the study of inscriptions, comes to the rescue. And I will quote Cartledge on what they tell us. Quote, There were rich and poor Spartans. This literary evidence, which we just discussed, is fully corroborated, emphasis mine, by archaeology from the 8th century and epigraphy from the mid-7th. End quote. Cartledge, 1979, page 165. And no, that archaeological verdict has not meaningfully changed since then, as far as I know. It isn't corroborated any earlier than that because we have no evidence earlier than that. So I want to be very, very clear. At every point where we have any kind of evidence whatsoever, no matter how limited or difficult, we have evidence for significant disparities in wealth among the Spartiates. This is not to say that there was never any change in the social stratification of Sparta. In contrast, there's been some supposition notably by Figuera, that it got quite a lot worse after the earthquake of 460. We'll talk about what that looks like next week. Spartiate economic equality is a myth. It was a myth in 100 AD. It was a myth in 360 BC. It was a myth in 480 BC. It was always a myth. It was never true. Conclusions who matters. This is necessarily a somewhat artificial place to divide these posts. I promise we'll get back to some of these issues, what wealth and power disparity among Spartiates looks like, or why Lycurgus can do no wrong in the eyes of the sources, next week and the week after. But I want to take a step back and look at the issues we've addressed so far from the perspective of how we relate to history. It is human nature, when we are told a story, to sympathize and identify with the teller of the story and the people they place at the center of the story. TV Tropes calls this protagonist mind in morality, and it is an apt term. We come to feel what the protagonist feels and value what they value. This is all the more true for the things and people the story omits. The unwary reader does not know what they do not know. For our sources, the Spartiates, and in particular, the wealthy, elite, successful Spartiates, are the protagonists of the story of Sparta. And so the morality of that story revolves around them. In the study of history, of course, this is a trap, and a frequent one. Students naturally sympathize with the literate ruling class of past societies seeing themselves in the shoes of military aristocrats and rulers, rather than the vast majority of farmers and laborers, both because that is the perspective our sources give, but also because that tends to be the history we teach, the history of power and politics. All too often, I see students read the Greek contempt for the poor man, the non-citizen, or the slave, with horror, but then 
immediately turn around and replicate those patterns of thought in their own thinking about these societies. Well, of course the mob cannot be trusted to rule, Thucydides and Xenophon said so, to which I am endlessly responding, yes, but should you believe them? With Sparta, the case is worse still, because it is not a matter of falling into the contempt of your sources, but their disregard. The sources do not care about the helots, because the sources are wealthy Greeks who do not see slavery as a moral evil. If they are bothered by helotry, it is only because it is even crueler than normal Greek slavery. Xenophon is quite happy to ignore the helots entirely whenever he can. Xenophon's constitution of the Lacedaemonians runs 118 sections, of which two mention the helots and neither by name or at any length. Xenophon uses either dolus, chattel slavery, or oikitis, household slave. But in both cases, given Sparta's social system, it is clear that a helot must be meant. It would be easy to forget, reading it, that the helots were there at all. Harder, of course, in Xenophon's Hellenica since they end up being militarily important. This is, I want to stress, an attempt by Xenophon to describe the whole of Spartan society, which omits around 93% of the people in it. Xenophon also omits the periokoi, including, literally, everyone who produces anything of value at all whatsoever. If ever there was a sign, a source needed to be read critically, friendly history teacher note, read all sources critically, this is it. But of course, we are not trapped by our sources. We can and should think about the many, many people our sources do not care about. We must ask if this society produces a better human experience. Not just for the aristocrats our sources pal around with, but for all of the people. A society which exalts the few by immiserating the many isn't the same as a society which actually improves the quality of life for the majority of the people within it. This is part of what I mean when I say that we may accept our sources facts, but need not accept their judgments. We do not need to agree with our snobbish sources that the best society is one that is best only for the elite. So, let's recap. The dominant human experience living in Sparta was being a helot. If we were to give an hour-long lecture on the human experience of living in Sparta, we would spend 51 of those 60 minutes on the helots. That's 51 minutes of murders, beatings, rapes, forced extraction, poverty, and humiliation. After which, there are five to six minutes on the lot of the periokoi, and then, just as everyone is stuffing their notebooks into the bags, dear my readers, don't do this. It drives me bonkers we get to the Spartiates. Rather than being egalitarian, Sparta was in fact a deeply stratified society. More than 90% of the residents of the Spartan state belongs to one kind of underclass or another. Consequently, the Spartiates shouldn't be understood as composing the state or talked about in isolation because they're not a self-sufficient society. Instead, the Spartiates are just a local nobility, the elite of a much larger, far less equal society. Nevertheless, the myth of Spartiate economic equality is also false. There were always rich and poor Spartiates at every historical point we have evidence for. Part of the reason I lean so hard on cartilage, despite his scholarship being a bit older, is to show that we've known this for a while now. It is not a new revelation that all of our sources think Spartan equality ended 10 minutes ago, despite being separated by centuries. Nevertheless, high school and even college textbooks 
continue to credulously spout the myth, embracing the pleasant lie instead of the unpleasant truth. Indeed, this credulous approach to the source tradition, accepting not only the facts they give, but also their guesses about what is to them the distant past and their judgments about the moral worth of a Sparta that probably never existed, is so common that it has had a name since 1933, Le Mirage Spartiate, coined by Francois Ollier. Rousseau and Jefferson had an excuse for their gullibility. We do not. Next week, we'll look at the ramifications of this kind of social stratification through the lens of Spartan families, Helot families and Spartiate families both. But also, we'll start taking a closer look at some of these free non-citizen Spartan underclasses and what they mean for understanding Sparta. This has been a recording from a collection of unmitigated pedantry, the blog of history professor Brett Devereaux, recorded by myself, A Great Divorce, for accessibility and sharing purposes. If you enjoyed this content and wish to engage with it or support Brett, please check the description for links to the original posts on his blog, his Twitter, and his Patreon. I highly encourage you to share, support, and engage with his works on any and all platforms, if you are so inclined. If you wish to support me, please do remember to like, share, and subscribe to this and any other content here that you enjoy. Thank you so much for listening.